Hello, TalkHouse listeners. This is Josh Modell. We've got a special treat for you this week. Instead of the usual TalkHouse podcast, we're featuring the debut episode of a podcast called That's How I Remember It with Craig Finn. Finn, as you hopefully already know, is the singer of The Hold Steady as well as a solo artist. He's got an excellent new solo record called A Legacy of Rentals out now, and it inspired him to start a new podcast that explores the intersection of memory and creativity. The TalkHouse gang helped him put it together, and we're happy to present the first episode here. If you like it, which you undoubtedly will, please subscribe. Here it is, the first episode of That's How I Remember It with Craig Finn, featuring Craig in conversation with Patterson Hood of Drive-By Truckers. Enjoy, and we'll be back to regular TalkHouse episodes next week. Hey, I'm Craig Finn. I recently put out a record called A Legacy of Rentals. It's a record about memory, how we remember friends that are gone, places that have changed, major events that are part of our past. The songs are memorials, incantations, affirmations, legends, and prayers. Like all stories, they're subject to the imperfection and limitations of memory, the distortions that happen to our own histories when stretched by time and distance. These small adjustments often become part of the stories themselves. A lot of things happened while I was writing this record. The pandemic started, a close friend passed away, The murder of George Floyd put my hometown of Minneapolis in the headlines. I became really interested in how we're gonna remember these moments, what stories we would tell ourselves and others, and how these memories might grow into other forms. I decided to create a podcast called That's How I Remember It, to talk to other creative people about these moments and memories. The title comes from a song in this record called Never Any Horses, in which two people have wildly different recollections of the same event. That sort of thing fascinates me. I started out by talking to my friend Patterson Hood from the great Drive-By Truckers. He's one of my favorite songwriters and storytellers. I knew he'd have something good to say on the subject. I was shocked and thrilled to learn that the great DBT song, 18 Wheels of Love, might be built on a shaky foundation. Even as he introduces it on the recording with, every one of these goddamn words is true. Things change as new information comes to light. We also talked about the great new DBT record, Welcome to Club 13, and about songs as memorials, as monuments to remember people who are no longer with us. I love talking to Patterson, and I hope you enjoy listening. The history's rewritten When the memories get meddled with The way that I remember it Do you consider yourself to have a good memory? Overall, yes. My wife and, and a lot of people who know me consider me to have kind of an uncanny memory. And uh, I had a I had a great uncle who's uh, passed away now, but who by all counts had like what they call a photographic memory. He could just summon any date in his life and tell you exactly what he did in minute detail, tell you what people around him were wearing. I mean, it was incredible. And and at Thanksgiving, so you can imagine how fun Thanksgiving was when he's like, yeah, Thanksgiving 1937. And, you know, so-and-so came over and brought this potato salad. And I mean, just these crazy little details. And, and he was a great writer. And, uh, and so I always tell people that the writing gene, if there is such a thing, came from that side of my family, from the Johnsons. And, uh, I, my memory is nothing like that, but I do have a real good one. But in the last few years, ironically, in what we're talking about, I've grown to question it because there are things that I was absolutely written in stone sure about that I've come to find out wasn't really quite that way. And uh, it's like, well, I don't think I'm like, I'm certainly not intentionally lying, you know, but but it's it's I was really wrong. Is there anything? Is there anything in particular that that you think of off the top of your head that that you got wrong, or is it just things that come up? Just crazy details about things, and uh, um, I don't count. I don't count the eighteen wheels of love story as something I got wrong because that was that was that came that was someone else's story that they told that was turned out to be a lot of it fiction <laughs> because we, <laughs> we kind of came to find out that Chester was kind of a compulsive liar. And, uh, and so <laughs> there was a lot of things that 
we were a bill of goods. My mom and all of us were sold that wasn't quite as it, his name wasn't even Chester. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we didn't find that out till he was like dying and mom was trying to get his VA benefits and, uh, and couldn't understand why the VA didn't want to give him his benefits after him being such a war hero. But, uh, so, uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't count that one because I, I, I'm just, rep I was reporting the story as, you know, as it was told to me, it was all true except for the Porter Wagner part. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, well, I mean, that, that and this again, I'm so glad you said yes, because I do, do you think, do you think it's necessary or do you think it's helpful for you as a writer to have a good memory? Oh, I think it's certainly helpful. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are great writers who don't, you know, who just can make it, make it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, but so much of my writing is is tied in with with memories and and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, not necessarily journalistic truth, but 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 definitely uh, family folklore storytelling. I guess would be probably more akin to what I do. Sure, sure. Yeah, and you know, I mean, Kerouac, I know, was like, his nickname when he was young was Memory Babe because he had that thing where he could, you know, pull up details. And I think of other artists we know, including our friend Will Johnson, who I think is a kind of a spectacular memory. I know he can do things with, like, baseball scores and baseball games that uh, that the rest of us can't do, you know? Um, yeah, he and I'm, David Barbie. Oh, Barbie <laughs> too, Yeah. Oh, David Bar uh, David Barbie can give you stats from like the eighteen hundreds baseball, like you know, you know, early early day baseball. He can tell you stats and figures. It's unreal. Did you know David Carr, uh, the journalist? Did you, did you ever know him? He interviewed me once, and uh, it was it was it, after he passed away. I, I ended up coming across his his that interview, and it was like one of the best it was like a really really good one and uh uh I, I wish i'd gotten to speak with him more but yeah uh, but i didn't know him i just the one time i knew him a little bit and and he wrote a great book called the night of the gun and that's one of the kind of things i think a lot about when starting this podcast is uh he tells a story in that book about you know he was an addict and he goes back to minneapolis to kind of investigate his past and he went back and he told this story about one night him and his friend getting kicked out of a bar and he's angry at his friend. So his friend runs away and he, he kind of goes across town to find his friend to kick his ass. He goes up the stairs at his friend's place and his friend comes out with a gun and chases him away. Now, when he goes back 20 some years later, he tells this guy, he meets up with this guy and he says, do you remember this night? And his, his friend says, well, yeah, I remember that except one thing, you had the gun. And that was, uh, that is kind of like, I always think of that story is that like we build these stories and, uh, we go about our lives, um, thinking about one thing and, um, obviously th they affect storytelling that, you know, we do in our art. When you talk about your memories, um, are there other senses involved, taste or smell or anything like that? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How about like, you know, as music fan, are there records that, uh, Always. There's always a record playing. Every memory has a song attached to it. How about seasons? Like, are there records that you associate with different seasons or anything? For sure. For sure, including what season we made a record or put out a record, too. You know, it, it, all of that ties in. I think I'm real, I think I'm really tuned into that or, or, think, or think of myself as such anyway, as such. But, uh, the older I get, the more I question everything. Do you, like with other artists' records, do you, are there any records that you think of of specific seasons? Like I, for I, for instance, "Let It Be" by The Replacements is always going to be a fall record for me uh, because that's when it came out. And uh, um, right. Reckoning. Well, Tim for me, yeah, also a fall record, right? Yeah, Reckoning actually came out in the spring, and uh, so it's a spring record for me. Although I listened to that record obsessively for at least nine months when it came out. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I think of Benny and the Jets as like early spring. And that's like one of those records, you know, when I was like turning eight years old that I was like so obsessed with. And, uh, 
Todd Rundgren, something, anything is always like the last week of sixth grade because that's when my cousin Tommy played that record for me the first time and it just completely blew my mind. And uh, and uh, I, I became obsessed with it. And it's still probably my all-time favorite record. Yeah, that's cr- wow. Uh, yeah, Reckoning, I think I, I found it in the fall and, uh, the, you know, it's a, a forever a fall record for me. Uh, because I remember listening to it as I changed schools going to ninth grade and I'll just, and again, it's that, that smell of autumn. It's all those. And I can't really listen to it it, at other times. I mean, I like it always, but it just, I, I never think to put it on until it gets a little chill in the air, et cetera. Um, do you have any gaps in your memory? Like, are there periods of your life you remember less of? Yeah, and especially more lately, what scares me sometimes, you know, because I'm I'm terrified of like losing it. I mean, of like you know, you know, uh, probably getting Alzheimer's is one of my absolute biggest fears, and uh, and and so I'm very aware when I discover the gaps. You know, there there's there's certain years of our touring life that. I think I've just kind of blocked out because there were some bad years and, uh, and I don't really like thinking about the bad years. And, um, you know, and it's, it's so funny because some of those years are years that people on the outside who are fans of my band associate as our glory days. And, uh, and I'm always like, God, those, those days were terrible. You know, it's like, I'm glad you like the music we made, but God, you know, I'm sure glad I don't live there. Yeah, but. yeah. I, I, I have the, I have a very similar. Boys and Girls in America for me was um, an extremely emotionally hard time in my life. Um, uh, things going on at home and and just chaotic, just you know, uh, really chaotic. Uh, you know, every night we played shows that were were triumphant, and it was almost. I almost looked back at it being like belligerent, like we're gonna have a really good time tonight because when we're Dawn, I'm going to get a phone call and it's going to be terrible, um, you know. And but I but I I think some of the same thing. And I, I so that leads me to another question. Um, do you think you're more likely to remember a good experience? Well, I'm I'm more likely to to dwell on it. But I mean, I definitely have some vivid memories of some bad experiences, you know, from my from my childhood onward and. Uh, but I, but I maybe maybe I remember them differently, you know. I, I I've never thought about it like that until just now. But I might remember them in a different kind of way. Yeah, I remember my junior high, um, and like most people, my junior high was awful, and I was bullied and all that. And I remember that in black and white. Um, uh, um, wow. And I think I was actually probably depressed, like you know, in a in a medical sense. Um, but I do remember it only in black and white. And uh, I think that that might be a reaction to some kind of, you know, light trauma. Right. You know, when I think back on, I was bullied in, in fifth and sixth grade, particularly bad were, were the years I was bullied. And, uh, and I went to two different schools those two years. And when I think about them in a visual sense, <laughs> It's it's the fluorescent light of the school. Everything's lit like that. Like if it was a movie, it would be like the most badly lit movie. And, uh, you know, and I remember the smells of the cafeteria to the extent to where when my oldest first started public school for the very first time in pre-K, when we went to, to register and everything, the it was in the cafeteria and I smelled the cafeteria and I had this really like, like uncontrollable reaction to it. It's like, I got, it's like, I got really anxious and kind of angry. I wanted to get out of there. I didn't want my kid to go to school there. I got, it was very, very like off the, you know, I kept it mostly to myself. I mean, Rebecca could tell that something was wrong. You know, what's up? You know, it's like, I, you know, I could, couldn't even talk about it until we left. And I got like really emotional about it. And I think that was wise. Like I smelled the cafeteria and it reminded me of the smell of I'd get beat up after lunch. You know, I'd go to lunch and then on my way back to class, I'd get pulled in the bathroom and they'd beat the shit out of me every day. And, uh, and so, uh, 
uh, it, it all came bubbling back. Things that I hadn't even thought of at the time in years came came back to me that day. Uh, wow. Yeah, that I mean that that's exactly the kind of thing I I'm I'm thinking of, and I think that that's it's a massive like these these other senses are such a trigger, um, and 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 kind of can sneak up on us, right? I mean, you know, um, well, hopefully a happier memory. Do you have a first musical memory or something that you you know roughly first musical memory? Uh, my dad coming home with Magical Mystery Tour, and I was three, and I remember him opening it up and putting it on, and I can remember here in Strawberry Fields Forever, and I was looking through, you know, it has the book that comes with it, you know, with, they're all in the, there's like the animal costumes and all the crazy stuff in that book, and I'm looking through that and, and hearing that music and thinking it's just, it's like, ah, oh, this has got to be the most incredible thing ever, you know? As far as like books, movie, art, you know, that, or stories, whatever, um, are there uh, eras that you're like, do you think you're particularly like drawn to due to, you know, your personal experience or your own memories? My, when I was a kid, like, especially the era I was talking about earlier, fifth, sixth grade time, you know, I, I lived this really double life because I, I spent about five days a week, like the unhappiest kid imaginable. And then I spent the weekends, like the happiest kid imaginable. Because I was out at my uncle's farm, uh, George A., that I've written pretty extensively about through the years, and, uh, and the whole Heat Lightning album, and uh, and um, Sands of Iwo Jima, and all of that, and uh, and my grandmother, and I stayed out on his farm every weekend, and he took me to movies, and we'd stay up late watching movies on TV, and I had my that's where I kept my stereo and my records, because then when I made bad grades. My parents couldn't ground me and take my records away from me, and uh, so all my so I kept them all out there where they were because what happened out there they like kind of had no control over and they were busy doing whatever they did on weekends and and uh, uh, so it was like I, so I had this other life and I'd ride my go kart with my cousin Tommy and and it was like idyllic I mean it was like the most idyllic childhood imaginable. And then on Sunday afternoon, I would start getting physically ill, dreading Monday. And, uh, you know, and then during the week, it was awful because I was I was usually grounded because my grades were terrible. And, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily get along with my mom well. And my dad was basically at work. So I didn't really see him a lot except for in the mornings. He would get me off to school in the morning. So and school was just torture. It was a nightmare. You know, I may, I, the, my teachers didn't like me. The kids didn't like me. And, uh, and I was so, so it was this crazy duality, you know, which uh, again, I'm, I'm, it's been such a running theme in my writing for my adult life has been various dualities, you know, people who are Good people who do terrible things and people who are, are you know, th all kinds of dualities is like such an obsessive of mine in my writing and in my art. So, and I think that might be where part of where that comes from. Yeah. Yeah. That may, I mean, that makes tons of sense. Do you think, do you think in any way, like, do you ever get, uh, draw on that to not just in your art, but sort of in your ambition? Like, do you, do you say, like, fuck those people? I'm going to go start a rock and roll band, and we're going to go around the country? <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, fuck yeah. You know, and I was already writing songs then. I mean, I'd, I started writing when I was eight, and, uh, you know, and which I'm sure is part of why I was bullied because kids thought I was a weirdo. You know, it's Alabama public schools, man. You know, I didn't play. I wasn't good at kickball. I wasn't good at any sports. And so, therefore, you know, I was a you know, a uh, faggot is what they call me, you know, and, 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 and so I was, you know, and, uh, so, 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 yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I'm sure that's where a lot of my, you know, my insane level of drive in what I do has come from. Cause I, I think by any, I think by any count, you could say I've been insanely driven. Yeah, I'd say so. And my work ethic is pretty off, off the, pretty off the hook and uh you know and I'm and I'm and I'm proud of it I'm proud of my work ethic I'm, I'm sometimes feel sorrow for other people 
that have been maybe sometimes hurt by it. I mean, I, I, I really work hard at not letting my work ethic keep me from being a good dad. I'm, I'm, I'm really conscious about trying to be a good dad and, and a good husband. And uh, so that's, you know, and, and I think that sometimes my work ethic is the enemy to that because there's a battle there. But, uh, uh, but I keep most of that battle in my head and, and try to err on the side of, of parenting, at least when I'm home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously you've gone, I, I mean, this is since I, before I knew you personally, since I've heard your band, speaking of memory, I forgot to count up how many records it's been since I've known you. Uh, and since before I've known you, since I known the drive by truckers, but I was like, I probably have listened to a drive by truckers record on or before release day more than any other band in the history of rock and roll because, you know, it, you've put out so many. And, and I've, you know, I, it's, it's that rewarding of a, you know, as a friend, but also as a fan. Um, and that speaks to the drive. But, um, but that is a good transition because one of the things you seem to have done throughout your career, you know, and to talk about these characters that you've written and the dualities, uh, you've created mythologies around people, places, events, um, the first DB2 record I found, I fell in love with the Southern Rock Opera, and it blew me away in the way it put forth and tore down legends about rock and roll as well as the American South. Now, um, do you build these myths and legends to honor memory, um, people, you know, and in doing so, do you think you attempt to create a history that's more accurate, more appealing, more empathetic? Wow, that's, that's great questions. Uh, uh I mean, at least subconsciously, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how consciously I was aware of that aspect. You know, when we were writing Southern Rock Opera, you know, it started out as a an outline for a, a screenplay that Earl Hicks and I were going to write, and uh, we got as far as outlining it and uh, naming naming the band Beta Max Guillotine and and. Uh, we knew it was going to end with a plane crash. You know, it got about that far, and, and then, uh, and then I got busy, you know, doing the band thing. But that idea, something about it, just kept on churning. And we were, you know, we were in the van uh, touring in the early, early days, and there was, you know, long drives and a, a crappy stereo, and we'd just end up. It was more fun to talk about that than to talk about, you know, how how bad Cooley's fart smelt or whatever. You know, it was just, it was it was more fun to to talk about that, and uh, and it was something we could start talking, and we would just kind of brainstorm, and uh, uh, it, it engaged everybody, and uh, and it kept me from focusing on being terrified that we were going to die at any minute out there because I was really terrified of of uh dying in a in a van accident you know i guess because of jody grind which today's the anniversary actually of that but uh and 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 some of those things that you know it happened kind of in our periphery and uh and for years i had that as such a uh a thing, you know, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't go to sleep in the van if we were driving, even at night or whatever. I couldn't fall asleep. I was, I preferred to drive, or, but if Cooley was driving, I had to be in the passenger seat and I had to be really aware. And, um, and then there's a, a something that happens on it's, 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 there's been references in like two or three of our songs, including the driver on the new record, uh, where we were on Interstate 10 in Florida and we passed a guy going the wrong way on the interstate. And we were in the right lane and the guy went flying by in the left lane. We were doing at least 70, 75. That guy was probably doing at least 80. And uh, we just happened to not be in the passing lane. And uh, from that moment on, I've never been scared again on the road. It was like it never, I could sleep like a baby out there. It's like, well, it, it obviously, my number wasn't up. And if it was, there's nothing I could have done about it. And it just, it's like, it just evaporated. And, uh, and that's why I think that's, I think that's why that's kept coming up. And it was in hell, no, I ain't happy. And there's at least one other song that's referenced it, but, uh, but I definitely address it at the end of the driver and um, on the new record. And I think that's a, 
a big part of that. I uh, yeah, you know, funny enough, there's a Hold Steady song about driving the wrong way down 169. Uh, that's that's in Hornets, and uh, so that's something our band and have us in common. Driving the wrong way is uh, is uh, I mean that's like a, a so did y'all pa- y'all pass somebody no. y'all pass somebody like uh, that? I I ended up uh, uh, that was more of like a, a sort of a thing mythologizing myself i spun around on that on that uh road and then and then start and then we started going the other way before we turned on but it was a that kind of thing it was a oh, memory sure. that that you know but but an almost accident and um you know I, I on the southern rock opera thing i remember when i heard it for the first time and i again i'm from minnesota i there's part of me that thinks that's the furthest from the South. And then there's part of me that says it's just another region that, that, you know, resembles another, you know, um, but I, I felt like when I listened to Southern rock opera, there was almost a Howard Zinn thing of, you know, kind of correcting history. And, and, you know, certainly the thing about the, the three Alabama icons and, you know, getting, getting kind of a fresh take on it and maybe sort of a critical reassessment of Leonard Skinner in some way too, um, in a way that I hadn't thought of, but, um, so I, I think in that in that sense that that kind of thing uh, is something you've done always. But again, as you mentioned, right off the bat, the new record you open with a driver. It's a seven minute song. Seems like you know a memory and a dream in some way. You're looking back on your your younger self, driving around aimlessly. Sometimes you know you talk about um, coming across a Klansman and a burning dumpster. Uh, you mentioned again something we listening to. Here comes a regular. Um, what's on the stereo. And, um, and then you talked about the band here. And um, I was trying to think, have you in a song before this one mentioned DBT or a member of DBT so explicitly? I guess at times, I mean, I know road cases on Southern rock opera and, you know, I, I, I really blurred the lines between you know, the fictional band, the fictional band Betamax Guillotine was sort of Leonard Skinner, but it was sort of DBT. You know, it was, it was, it was very blurry. And, 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 uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was intentionally blurry or if it was just, that's just how it came. I mean, that, that was, you know, it's, it's funny because my memories of writing that record are so good i mean like 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 writing that record i look at as as one of the most joyous things of my creative life and making that record it's one of the absolute most horrific <laughs> collection of memories of my creative life i mean making that record was a nightmare that just would not end and kept getting worse. And as it, as it kept going, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And, uh, we all felt trapped and angry and were taking it out on each other. And it was just, you know, it was was awful. And the band was like just this close to breaking up. And I think the only reason we didn't break up is we were all so fucking stubborn that, we somehow somehow had the sense to know that if we didn't see it through, we would never amount to shit for the rest of our lives, and it would be and and we would be utter failures. and And I think that fear of that is what forced us to see it through and come out the and see it to the other side. That and David Barbie talking enough sense into us a couple of times along the way to just you know you know. Telling me not to send that letter I wrote. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like it's like you know, fold it up, put it in your pocket, take it home, sit on it for six months, pull it out, read it. If you want to send it then, send it then. You know, probably best advice anyone ever gave me. I, I found it some years later and burned it. It's like, oh my god, I'm so glad I didn't send this fucking letter. You know, and. Uh, uh, what a total embarrassment, you know. It's like I was that crazy that I almost sent that. But uh, but I literally, I think we all literally went insane making that record. And so it's such a crazy, you know, and then and then Decoration Day is the opposite because writing it was awful. It was like I was getting divorced. My band wasn't speaking to each other. You know, it was called Heathens was the working title of it. And, and... And then as I was nearly finished, 
all the songs got stolen in a backpack from the back of our van while we were playing CBGB's the only time we ever played there. And, uh, and, uh, but then somebody found the notebooks on the sidewalk in New York city. And, uh, they, whoever stole the backpack, opened it up a few blocks away, saw a bunch of junk in it, emptied it out, kept the backpack, kept going, found the notebooks, found a phone number in there and was able to track me down and brought my notebooks back to me when I played brownies a few weeks later. And, uh, uh, you know, my, you know, New York, I, my, my love affair with New York, you know, is never ending. And, uh, but that may be the high, the high water mark of it all was that day getting my notebooks back. But then making what became Decoration Day was just a blast. First time we ever had a record that actually somebody was paying for us to record. We got to go in the studio. We got to take a couple of weeks and do it exactly right and have Barbie taking care of the technical details and you know we had Isbel in the band and the band was kicking ass and you know songs were first takes and second takes and it was awesome yeah well that's a great new york story uh, <laughs> like like the, that's uh that should be in a book someday speaking of new york the first time i saw drive by truckers live it literally 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 changed my life the show was so good so fun I immediately wanted to start a band again. I didn't have a band at the time. Band and I started the band with my friends. We called it the Hold Steady. That show was at the Bowery Ballroom. And I think it was the first time you'd ever played there. Do you have any sense of what month and year it was? I do not, and I haven't looked. It would be, um, I kind of think it'd have to be 2002. That sounds right to me. That sounds right. Wouldn't it? Because I know we did... I know we played their Halloween of 2003, and uh, that was uh, that was when we all went as Andy Griffith's show characters, and uh, that was fun. But I know that wasn't our first time. That was either our second or third time playing there. So it was probably 2002, and um, God, I love that room. Love that room so much. Still love it. So amazing, and I, I just rem I remember so many details of it, you know, from... I remember someone giving Jason a one hitter and, and I remember the big bottle of Jack Daniels. I remember I, you guys did, you kept playing and it was so good. And then I remember doing a bow at the end, which I took to this, like, you know, like, like, you know, coming from indie rock, I thought that was really show busy in a cool way. Like I thought that was really, really polite <laughs> and, uh, or, or a cheesy way. You know, I mean, at the time at I was it. just like, like you're so I, that's how I experienced it. And it was loose and, but we, I love, I love showbiz. I mean, I, I do. I, 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 I love the, I love the, the, a little bit of stick in it is, is, is fun, you know, in a, in a, in a kind of a nodding wink kind of way. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of, I'm aware of how inherently cheesy some of that can be. But I feel like we're in on the joke. I mean, I feel like, and, and, and yet we're also deadly serious. I mean, we, 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 we mean it to the core, especially me, you know, I mean, Cooley, you know, well, even Cooley, Cooley embraces it, which is such a, a duality in his personality because he is such a no bullshit guy. And he is such a, he does tend to look at least on the surface, look down at, at things like the, the ritual aspects of the rock show type things. And yet he also really embraced, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do it if he didn't embrace it. You know, he's got to embrace it. There's no way it would work. And, uh, you know, and Cooley's the first one to tell you, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, if, if he would be, he wouldn't like it if anyone on stage didn't wear shoes he approved of. <laughs> I mean, Cooley's got, you know, so there's a showbiz side to him too. You know, he is the stroker ace. And uh, yeah, I think like for me, as I, especially as I get older, I'm more into like the showbiz part of it than I am into the sort of nineties indie rock thing where it's like not cool to tune or something. I mean, Hey, we're all here. We made the effort to get these amps on stage. Let's, 
let's do it right, you know? <laughs> like I've always rebelled against not smiling in band photos. It's so not cool to smile in band photos, but I fucking love being in a band. I love, I don't like photo sessions, but no one likes photo shoots much unless, I mean, you know, Stanny Clinch is kind of fun because I love him, but, but, uh, get to hang with him. But, but generally I don't really enjoy that part of it, but even, even that part of it is part of the job. And, and, but I love being in a band, you know, it's like, I love that Matt Patton, our bass player, who's, probably one of the coolest people I've ever known in my life. But on stage, his joy in playing is so just, I mean, explodes out of him. And I fucking love that about him. And especially the fact that it comes from a guy who can be pretty certain. <laughs> and, and he is, and he is, he's, super critical and he is super cool and he's you know he's he's the if if i played a record for all of my guys even more than cooley he's the one more likely to be critical about it and to and to turn up his nose about it but when he gets on stage and he's playing it's just this thing happens and it's so beautiful and uh and i love that and uh, uh one of the many things i love about him uh, I just had a memory that just this jarred loose that uh, when we started the hold steady after we've been going about a year, a guy told me, uh, he came up after, he said, man, I went to like, you know, 50 shows last year and only two bands smiled on stage and it was you guys in the drive-by truckers. And I was like, oh, <laughs> we're doing something right. But, um, you know, that Bowery show, uh, at that show, I'm pretty sure, I, and again, this is, you know, loose, but I'm pretty sure you covered People people That Died by uh, Jim Carroll. Um, and you've, you know... I bet we did. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty and sure And you even did. mentioned the song on, on this record, on, on the title track of Welcome to Club 13. And you've written a few songs, um, a number of songs. Adam's House Cat covered it. and But even, even before that, in 1980, I was in a band in high school called Apollo. That's how, <laughs> you know, and uh, and it was uh, it was me and a guy named Jay Johnson, whose dad was Jimmy Johnson, my dad's partner in the Muscle Shoals rhythm section, and uh, and uh, I had a band. Jay had a band, and uh, Jay wanted my bass player who happened to also be my best friend, Alex. And uh, he tried to steal Alex. Alex wouldn't leave me. So Jay basically cooked up. We would merge the two bands. And his plan was to merge the bands and then kick me out and keep Alex. And uh, But his drummer, who was kind of the older, cooler, best person in the band. I always had a charmed life of drummers. I always had a curse with bass players for a long time that took a long time to overcome, I guess because of my dad. But uh, but I had a, I've always had a charmed life of drummers. The drummer loved me, and then Jay was stuck with me. And Jay wanted to play. It was all covers, you know, and uh, I, I couldn't get him to play my songs yet. But, uh, but Jay... Uh, you know, Jay wanted to play like, you know, more basically 70s metal, you know, and uh, some of which I loved playing, but I also was really into like punk and new wave. And I, and so we covered People Who Died. And that was the only song they'd let me sing because I couldn't really sing worth a shit, but I could scream the words and I knew the words. So I, I've covered People Who Died since I was 16, which is the year it came out. Wow. I guarantee I've played it on stage way more times than Jim Carroll ever did. Oh, I get. Yeah, I guarantee you for sure. Yeah, you know, you know, yeah. you this, but you know, you've written a number of songs about people who are no longer with us, people who've died. Uh, Grand Canyon, The Living Bubba, um, and there seem to be a few of these on the record, uh, real or fictional. Um, um, Far too many. Are these harder songs to write than others? They're harder to live because I I miss my friends and I I I. I I grieve them all so hard, and uh, but the but they're actually probably the easiest songs for me to write because I don't even feel like I write them; they write themselves. You know, Shaken Pine. I had no idea what Shaken Pine on the new record was about, and uh, I, I wrote it in uh, I think it was December of 2020, 
And it's when I first started writing again because I couldn't write during most of the lockdown because I was I was in such a bad place and uh, uh, just very little would come out. But I, I went up and I wrote it super fast, like 15, 20 minutes. And uh, I came downstairs. My wife was in bed reading or something. And I sat down and I played her the song and she was just totally silent. And uh, she's like, is that's not about us, is it? And uh, I was like, no. She said, well, what's it about? Like, I don't know. It's like, I have no idea what it's about. It's like, in fact, I couldn't even start to tell you what it's about, but I can promise you it's not about us. She goes, would you tell me if it was? I'm like, probably not, but it's not. You know, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I, prob I probably would lie to you and tell you it's not, but it's not. I promise you, it's not about us. It's like, I, I, that never even occurred to me, but I don't know what it's about. I don't know where it came from. I don't know. I'm, I really like it. I feel really strongly about it, but I have no idea where it came from or what it's about. And like seven months later, I was playing one of the first shows. I was playing solo after I got to start playing again. And I was on stage in Asheville, North Carolina, playing that song. And halfway through it, it's like I had this epiphany. It's like, that song's about my friend Jimmy C. And uh, uh, James Coogan, who is uh, the f actually world-renowned cheesemeister. And, uh, and we were friends, and I didn't even really realize, like, what a big deal he was in that world until after he passed away and all these like celebrity chefs are writing his obituaries and about how, you know, what a debt they owe him and all that. And I'm like, good God, I, you know, I knew he was in the cheese business, but I didn't know he was like, you know, world renowned. He was just my dear friend who I loved. And, uh, but it was about him and, uh, or, or he was definitely inspired it. And, uh, and, and, and once I figured that out, it's like it all made sense. It's like, oh, that's where it came from. It came from somewhere in the back of my subconscious. Well, that's the Joan Didion, I think, said something along the lines of we write to find out what we're thinking, you know? And I think that that right. happens all the time. That's beautiful. How, when, those, when those, you know, when you do, say, Grand Canyon or The Living Pub or whatever, do you, when that comes up in the set, um, is it, is it? Does the grief revisit you? Is it, is it the same every time? Do you just sing this song? Does it does it feel like, um, do they hit different than the songs that are about people that are still here or not about people at all or, you know, et cetera? Kind of all of the above. It's, I, I, it's definitely a bit of a visitation. I mean, I definitely see them when I see do those songs. And, uh, but there's, but it's also, there's like a personal thing just within me too. You know, it's like, if I'm if I'm really sick, which is kind of funny, I didn't do it last night because because last night I was I played a show and I felt really bad. I was I had bronchitis and it was very cold out. And it actually was it was an outdoor show. It was very cold and and uh, often when I'm playing a song under some kind of duress, I'll open with the living Bubba because I know if I open with the living Bubba, I'm going to get through the show and it's going to be okay because that song is about that. I mean, I saw I saw that guy play those shows literally dying, you know? I mean, like just dying in front of you. And, uh, you know, the last show I played with him, which was the last show he ever played, was less than two weeks before he died. And, I mean, he was a walking corpse on that stage. And, and he was also shredding guitar and telling horrifically terrible profane jokes and and saying some of the most awful banter you've ever heard anyone say, you know, and, and basically laughing and thumbing his finger at death on stage. And it was life-changing. And uh, I, I can't talk about it or play, play it without getting emotional about it. But, you know, like right now, but the other end of that equation is it also gives me a certain almost superhuman power if I'm sick to get through the show if I play that song. And so we don't play that song all the time because I, if that song's sacred, I don't, I feel like it would, it would lessen it if I played it every night, even though 
it's probably the best song I've ever written, and it's probably the best song I'll ever write. If I live to be 100, I'll probably never write a song that means as much to me as that one. And, and Grand Canyon has a similar, is Grand Canyon has a similar thing about it too, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I Grand, Grand Canyon, obviously I knew Craig, and uh, when I watched that, when I saw, you know, when I heard that for the first time, I remember being like, like just, I remember being at, um, where I was and, and, and thinking about how big, you know, it's a Grand Canyon. It's a big image, but just like, you know, those moments at the, at the beginning of the pant. Craig was so, he was such a Grand Canyon. <laughs> <brother>. <laughs> he was so bigger than life, you know, and, and still is even in death. He's just, he's just, you know, it's like, I still have people come up to me and tell me Craig stories that I had no idea about, you know, that happened on our tours that I had no idea about, you know, so and he's been gone almost 10 years. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we did two show, three shows in London, and we were flying back, and it was like March 8th, 2020. I mean, it was literally on, on our yeah. heels. and Getting freaky. On the plane home, I got a text that my good friend Brian Dilworth had passed. And, um, and I was, you know, I've had friends die, but this one was one of those ones that he was larger than life, and, you know, you didn't really – think that that was going to be the thing and all of a sudden you realize that that you know the stories stop here um there are a million stories but they stop here and i think that that was the moment when i started to really think a lot about the thoughts that have consumed me for the past few years about you know making about you know uh, again how we remember people um how we remember things but also this idea of art almost like you know like we're making like i was like got to make a record cuz it's almost like you're scratching your name in a tree right you know cf it's like i was here 20 t- 2022 here here's i was here and this is how i felt right like that's that's kind of how i i want to put you know like like mark my way through this world and then the pandemic obviously was was a huge part of that we all sat home and um obviously this is the P question, which I'm you're going to get a bunch um, with this record. How how did the pandemic affect this record? I know you told me earlier you think it was a mental health record in some way. Um, I don't know if you stick with that. I would I would agree. Um, but you know how how what, how did the pandemic play into this one? I, I mean, I'll probably be unpacking that for the next several years because I'm I'm you know. I, you know, on, on some levels, I went, I got through the pandemic easier than so many people. I mean, I didn't lose any, any close loved ones to COVID. Uh, you know, no one in my immediate family got it at the time, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, it's certainly not pre-vaccination or anything like that when it was killing so many, I'm obviously it's kept killing people, but, you know, generally, if we got it now, it most likely would be okay. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we didn't lose our house, even though I was terrified we would, because we were in a really vulnerable moment in time financially as a band and as a family simultaneously when everything shut down and all of a sudden there was no work, no money. And it's like, oh my God, you know, what are we going to do? It could not have been a worse time, but somehow we got through it. So, you know, it's like, so I don't really have, I don't feel like I have a right to say this, but, you know, I took it all really bad. I mean, it, it, it all went so against my nature because I'm a very, I'm a hugger, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very emotional people person. And the, the idea of not being able to go out, it's like, it's like, okay, what do I live for? I live to go out and play shows, eat at restaurants, uh, go to movies, go to rock shows. I mean, you make a list of like my top 20 things. They were all things that just did not exist for an indefinite future. And my response to it was just to completely shut down, be really angry and really depressed, and yet try to stifle both of those for the sake of my kids and my wife, because I didn't want to make them more miserable because they were going through their own shit, you know, and, and they were losing their friends and their 
school and their lives and, you know, and, um, and so I didn't really have a right to, to, to burden them with, with, with my bullshit, but goddamn my bullshit. I mean, every morning I did not want to get out of bed because it's like, there was nothing that I looked forward to, to enough to get out of bed for except a sense of duty. And it's like, well, what am I going to cook today? <laughs> you know, and uh, and I don't even like cooking that much, you know. But but I've cooked a lot, <laughs> and because uh, it gave me something that I could control and I could do, and uh, um, so so it's just it's, it's weird. So and I couldn't write, and you know when it first happened, it's like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that book I've been talking about forever that I never have time to do, and I'm gonna write that solo record I've been wanting to write because I've got and I, I've got a record I want to make that I haven't really completed writing. You know, I had all these things I was gonna do, and you know, I'll, I'll write another trucker record too while I'm at it, even though we've got a brand new one that hopefully we'll get to tour behind someday and and all that. That all shut down and I couldn't really do any of it, you know. And um but by the time I started writing, you know, it had all kind of you know, I wasn't really thinking about any of that. I mean, like I said, the song I wrote about my friend Jimmy, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize I was writing it about him, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll never wake you up in the morning. You know, that was, that was written about a specific person who passed away and, and then someone else passed away a few months later that it just as easily could have been about. And, you know, it's like it, it you know, there's, there was. So there's definitely this, you know, and obviously my my mental state played heavily into it. Um, but I, I I don't know. But I, I don't know exactly what the exact relationship is on that. Sure. Well, you know, th- it's funny because I, I was thinking about this and I, I think like I, you know, my when I looked back and the stuff I wrote was I wrote a lot. I was able to keep busy. That was the only thing I could think to do. But it was all, it was pretty heavy. Like everything was like, whoa, another person dying, another person. Um, but I'm like listening to your record and uh, especially coming off of two pretty political records, this one is less so. And, um, you know, Welcome to Club 13, the title track, I think it might be the, the, the lightest, I mean, or at least the most kind of fun song in a couple records. And... Um, Curious. Oh, and maybe longer, maybe way long, maybe since Let There Be Rock. I mean, it's it, it, it's sort of that type of song, and I and I love that about it. You know, I'm 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 real proud of that song. I wish I could write more of those songs. I wish I wrote more happy, joyful songs. You know, and it's sarcastic and kind of snide and and kind of shitty. You know, because uh, 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 I was a little worried when the it all first started getting announced. The guy who owned Club 13, I actually liked him a lot. And I was, I was really kind of, uh, I was like, God, I hope, I hope if he hears about all this, you know, I hope he doesn't think I'm really just being an asshole to him because I actually liked him. He was, a, he was a good guy. He liked, you know, he actually liked our band. He just, we just couldn't pull anybody. So there wasn't a lot he could do with us, you know? And, uh, and, and, he, and he commented on Facebook, and, he, and, and uh, uh, someone sent him a link to it, and he wrote, uh, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a real place, like, then. Oh, so to backing up, Club 13 was a real, a real place, place yeah. in Florence? It was. was it in Florence? It was... Uh, it was it was actually two places. It was originally at the Tennessee State Line back when we were at Dry County. So when I like in the seventies, my dad used to go there. I'm sure he was a member, you know. And uh, uh, it was like the nicest of the honky tonks up at the State Line because uh, they had the Roman numerals, you know, and uh, classy. And uh, <laughs> but then then when it then when it opened when um, when we went wet, which is when. Cooley, around the time Cooley and I met and when uh, the Shoals, you know, became a wet county and started having liquor, they reopened down there. And um, and and it was the nicest club in town, but, you know, it was industrial carpet and a lot of disco lights and the stage was about this high off the ground. And, uh, you know, and I actually saw... Uh, I actually saw Will Johnson play there one time way before I knew him, opening for Follow for Now in, back when he was in Funland. Oh, wow. That's a memory. There's a memory. I mean, 
it's see it's see it's it strikes me like um that you know it's a more of a local scene a local club than 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 you or or any touring band at, at your level sees at this point you know like like you're you're going out and you know do you, is there was there some nostalgia or sweetness to that uh, that idea in the song i mean that that you know just being around a rock thing that wasn't you know that wasn't about how many people you draw or i guess it was too but our you know just just some of the simplicity of all that if i mean it's it it was definitely it's it's a smart ass song you know it's 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 our anti glory days <laughs> you know it's like our glory days sucked man you know it's like but at the same time it was the only thing in town i'm glad it was there i'm glad there was cuz if it hadn't been there there wouldn't have been anything there you know it's like you know i'm you know i did see follow for now there i saw uh, colonel bruce there you know i saw you know and uh it, it gave us a place to play once in a blue moon on a Wednesday night, sometimes opening for a hair metal band, and Cooley would wear a dress, you know. Cool. And uh, it, it was, you know, it was something to do. Right on. Well, speaking of wild, Wilder Days, the album, that's where the album ends up. Um, even as it's in its title, it's a nod to different times. And I've talked to a lot of people um, who, in bands like ourselves, that, that wish, like, um, on the you know at uh, when they're uh, the, at the very first time the band started to get noticed feels like a blur to them and they wish they would have kind of taken notes or taken more photos or anything do you feel that way like like when you know southern rock opera I, it was probably the first time you guys were on like say late night tv right am i right yeah do you does uh actually decoration day yeah we did hell no I ain't happy on craig ferguson's show on decoration day uh and then did you do letterman after that Letterman wasn't until uh, way later. Letterman was uh, big to do actually before we did did Letterman. It might have been Ferguson then. I remember. I remember. Uh, I remember seeing. We did Conan Letterman. a bunch. We did okay. Conan a bunch after Ferguson. We did Ferguson twice. Uh, we did uh, Hell No Ain't Happy, and then a year later we did uh, Ferguson again and did Never Gonna Change, and then I think we did Conan for the first time doing Never Gonna Change uh, on Dirty South. I'm wondering if, if do you ever um, now or, you know, throughout your career, when things are happening, um, do you ever sort of remind yourself or tell yourself to slow down and try to, like, savor this moment, et cetera? I try to sometimes. Sometimes I, sometimes I actually remember to. Uh, we played the Roundhouse in London on uh, American Band, and uh, – I, I remember being on stage in the middle of the show and there being a moment where it's like, wow. You know, it's like Led Zeppelin played here, you know? It's like, you know, it's like if if the Beatles, you know, one of the places when they were doing Let It Be, you know, get back that they were discussing maybe doing a live show was the Roundhouse. You know, that might that's where they would have played if they'd played London probably at that moment. You know, it's like it's like and looking around and I mean it was, you know, we we came close to selling it out. We were and we weren't we weren't selling near that many seats anywhere in America at that moment in time, but we we had this huge crowd at the fucking Roundhouse and I remember going, God damn, this is fucking cool as shit, you know? I'm from a fucking redneck small dry county in Alabama, and I'm fucking doing this. This is pretty cool. You know, so there, there's been those. I'm grateful. I'm frequently grateful. I'm I'm getting better at that. I sort of feel like when things were moving fast, I wish I would have written a few things down. Um, uh, but, but I think now that I'm a little older, I say, well, Remind yourself that this is pretty cool that you're, you know, whatever, wherever you are, that that there are people showing up. And um, so I have I have one last thing, I think. And uh, I, this is like a memory test a little bit. But um, in 2008, we went on Rock and Roll Made Swell tour. And I'm curious, because things run together, as I was just saying. Do you have any concept of where the first and last shows of the, that tour was? Yeah, I think. No, no. Wow. Uh, I mean, the first one was, wasn't it Louisville? Correct, yeah. Didn't we start in Louisville? And then we played the Ramen, and then we went down to Atlanta, then Florida, and uh, then we worked our way up. To Raleigh. And then we worked our way across. And 
Did we end in LA? We ended in LA. Was that the and, last? And for the record, I, I didn't look because I wanted to see if we could work this out together in real time. But yeah, we ended in LA and I remember that. I have a pretty good memory for this. The venues are pretty good. My my one thing that I was a little fuzzy on, I think we went like, so I went, I think we went um, Louisville, Nashville, Atlanta, Tallahassee, and then up Raleigh, Richmond. And then I think we might've gone up to like New York um, uh, and then done two at ter- the Terminal 5, which was Terminal five, sort of yep. new at the time. And then... um. We, we did the Boston and we did Philly. Um, and then we did, I think we did State College, Pennsylvania, because I believe that's where we were there on, on election day. Yep, we did. We had a day off there too. We, we, we had the day off election day because we had our, our buses parked next to each other and we were like celebrating because Obama won. And then we played, I think the next night played there. And, right. Uh, and then we went to Niagara then, uh, Falls, I think. Because remember we were, That's we were right. doing something yep. at Niagara Falls, day. and then we crossed over into Toronto, and then we came back down, and I think we did. Um, was that when Spat put on his uh, gorilla yeah. suit at Niagara Falls? Yes. And yeah. He was Emmy Emmy Award oh, Emmy Award I saw winning. He Spat. won an Emmy Award, and then, and then I think we did. <laughs> he won an Emmy. We did the weird Carnegie Carnegie Library and. Pittsburgh, uh, or outside Pittsburgh, that was a seated one. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. and then I think we did uh, Bloomington, Indiana, then Chicago, and then probably up to Minneapolis. And then here's mm-hmm. here's where Those it's getting. Great. Here's where it's the one th- the big mystery I have here is: Did we play Boise or did we have a day off in Boise? I think we played it. Played, I think we, but I'm not 100% sure. But I thought we played it. I think we might have had like driven there and like gotten there at some point. I remember being all together in a bar in Boise, and then maybe we the next day we played it. And then we did two in Seattle, one in Portland, two in San Francisco, one in LA. Right. So that's pretty good for us, uh, old timers to be able to put together a routing from 2008. Um, still a really fun tour. Yeah, that was such a special tour. That's that's still. One of the most special tours of of our lives. I, I truly, truly say that, you know, and um, on, on so many levels. And it was, you know, it was it was a on a personal level, it was kind of hard because I, I was, a, you know, I had still had a really small kid at home, and uh, my wife Rebecca fell and hurt herself around the time of Minneapolis or maybe like a day after Minneapolis. I think we were heading west from there and uh, she fell and hurt her back real bad, like chipped her uh, chip, chipped her uh, uh, vertebrae or something. And uh, so so I need, so I was really worried about that because she was at home with a small kid and 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 you know in, in severe pain and having to get help from other people and stuff. and so you know that was hard, but I was, uh, but God, it was such a just on stage. It was so joyous, you know. And you know, both of our bands were were going through a lot. You know, there were there were there were there were some cracks starting to show on the surface with both bands at that moment in time. Surface. Too. We had them. We had them in the uh, the surface and in the uh, engine block. But uh, you know, but it happens. You know, we've all come out the other side. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about like, you know, for me, I remember that tour being a big deal because, hey, so, you know, going to that show at the Bowery and seeing you guys do that, that bow, uh, thinking like that was really cool. Well, the tour ended up with all of us on stage doing a bow. And I thought, well, this is pretty good from from seeing those guys and saying we're going to start a band to um, being here in L.A. uh, I've got a photo of all of us. (laughs) At the L.A. that last night, being part of the bow, that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good, whatever six years of uh, you know a pretty good trajectory of get getting in there. Um, so I felt good. Of, I love that tour, and um, I love talking to you about all this. And um, I think that's uh, that's where we should leave it. Um, thanks for being um, part of the, the first, the first, you know, my guinea pig. But I, I really enjoyed our conversation, Damn. as I always do. And um, yeah. I, I I I never can get enough just talking to you. You know, even that tour we did, uh, you know, as brutal as that Europe tour was, you and me and Will, uh, for for reasons that had nothing to do with you and mm-hmm. me and Will, you know, I, I still that is such a vivid, wonderful memory of just the times we spent hanging out, talking, even though sometimes we're having to talk about 
how we wanted to kill somebody that was keeping the tour from being what it needed to be. But uh, I'm, um, uh, yeah, I'm honored to be your, your first guinea pig. It's great talking to you. I love you, man. Great. Yeah, I love you too. So there you go. A huge thanks to Patterson for joining as my first guest. Check out the great new Drive-By Truckers record, Welcome to Club 13, and join me next time on That's How I Remember It. I'm Craig Finn, and this is what it looks like.